Welcome to Decision Point, a podcast about overcoming adversity in sales and the growth that we experience in the process. I'm Brad Siemens. All right. Well, hey, so I I figure we'd spend this time today just catching up and uh, having you kind of tell everybody what you've been working on. I know you got a lot. You, you and I have met a couple times since I had you on hey, last time. And um, I'm excited for everybody to hear kind of what you're doing and trying to support you any way that we can. And so I'd say just take it take it from the top for people who didn't listen to the first episode. Do a rundown of your background and then talk about uh, sales org and what you're doing on the training and staffing side. Awesome, man. So. Yeah, uh, I've been in sales since 2006. I um, I started in car sales. Technically, before that, what kind of broke me into sales uh, real quick is uh, I was a, a battle rapper in a, in a previous life, and um, I started to make beats, and I turned it into kind of like a, a little sales funnel and, and kind of figured out how to do your follow-up, do your outreach. Uh, you know, at the time it was all through AOL instant messenger and, and email, but I was like, man, this is like, if I could do this, I probably can sell. It feels like I have a proclivity to be able to, to sell. Um, and I hopped in and gave it a shot and car sales was like the only sale I knew of outside of like door to door. Like my dad did door to door sales. So I knew of that, but I was like, all right, there's the dealership down the road. Let's give it a shot. And, um, hopped in, uh, did, did well. Um, you know, you learn a lot in the car business that I don't think you learn in tech sales, which I've, I've applied a lot, uh, particularly in our courses. Like you're not just asking questions, right? You are verifying their needs. You have to, but you, you sell the sizzle a little bit more. Um, it's more of an impulse purchase and you, I think you learn to like get somebody excited about the product, um, in a way that a lot of times isn't covered in tech sales. Um, but that being said, it doesn't pay as well. Uh, I moved on uh, from there to door to door sales, um, moved on from entry level all the way up to, you know, director, national director of sales had orgs of over, you know, 60 people are probably well over that nationwide and uh, still wasn't making great money, though. Uh, you know, it's 100 percent commission based. You know, when you're managing a team that's in Chicago, you're in Tampa. They go out and get in a van. They have to have permits to work in every little area that they're, they're out in going door to door. If the permit isn't perfect, then the cops will kick you out of where you are, even if you kind of should be there, and it affects your paycheck pretty bad. Uh, whether or and not what you are have you the selling right. door? To, what are you selling door to door? At that point, security it was deregulated electricity, in the Greater Chicago area. Um, uh, you know, so the, you picture a suburb of Chicago. We were probably out there. Um, funny about that door to door experience um, is, even as a director, I like to go out there and knock doors because I feel like you lead from the front and gets people excited, um, and they want to do what you're doing. Um, man, it's February and the rules in Chicago, um, residential is you can't go into the house, even if you are selling them. So they're ready to buy. It's almost a negative. Yeah. You're going to get the deal, but you're out on their porch standing, doing the deal in February in, uh, in Chicago. It's rough, uh, for sure, man. And, um, it was rough for, for, so even if they say, Hey, come on in, you're like, Hey, I can't come in. At least at the time you couldn't go in, you couldn't go inside. Um, so B2B was more attractive for sure. Cause you could get into the business and warm up a little bit. Yep. Um, have not like, I, that's why I love hiring people that had door to door experience. Cause it's just a level of grit that is kind of hard to get. And it's a level of perspective, um, that is really hard to give to somebody that hasn't done it. You get into tech sales, SDR is the hardest job, but if you get into tech sales and you were door to door before you're like, this is, yeah, it's the hardest job, but it's kind of a joke. So let's talk about the perspective. You've said a couple of things I want to I want to yep. kind of double tap on. Um, yep. One of them was the experience of getting people excited. And yep. when you sell cars, there's a moment to get them excited. So I want to revisit that. Um, but I also want to talk about the door to door perspective. So what it sounded like you were alluding to, hey, if you're a door to door salesperson, you have a broader perspective than you might have if you have a traditional software sales job. So can you talk yeah. a little bit of, is that what you were talking about? And can you a hundred percent dive in? Yeah. Okay. And, and don't get me wrong. Like the reality is the sales development role, in my opinion, is the most important role in the company. If there's no pipeline, there's what, what are we talking about? Yeah, nobody, um, nothing happens still, until somebody sells something. Exactly. And it's the hardest job. I it, like, because 
it, the way I relate it is uh, related to football, and I'm trying to get away from these sports analogies. You know, obviously, I want to want to resonate with more people, but I said the NER position, or we'll start with the AE. The AE position is like a wide receiver. So Randy Moss is in the Hall of Fame, and Randy Moss also took plays off. If he knew that they weren't targeting him on a route, he could kind of lackadaisically halfway jog up the uh, you know, field, and he's in the Hall of Fame, one of the greatest wide receivers of all time. Uh, that's an AE, you know, they can, you know, it's more skill based than it is will based when it comes to being an account executive, in my opinion, um, having a high level of skill, even if you don't have like this, it leaps off the page, your work ethic, you can still make it happen and, and be successful. An SDR is like a lineman. It, yeah, sure. There's skill involved, but it's a lot more, man. You got to line up every play. You take a play off your quarterback is toast and you're, you're probably gone by taking one playoff, you know, it's, it's still skill, but it's a lot more mental fortitude when it comes to that. And even as crazy as it sounds, even knowing that in all of those things, I think are objectively true. You come in from door to door with that perspective. You look at that SDR role and you're like, man, everyone's acting like these people are saving lives out here. This is nothing compared to the workload that I had. This is nothing compared to the conditions that I had to work in, the level of mental toughness that I needed to effectively do this job successfully, consistently, every day. It's a different world. And I, that perspective, when you bring that in and you put them on the floor with SDRs and you train them properly, you're hard pressed to find one that's not going to ragdoll everybody because they just, they're built different. It, it, it's, it's very tough for you to, to have that level of intensity and that level of perspective in that role if you haven't done something way hard before. Do you think the one thing that the um, door-to-door, if you've been successful in door-to-door sales, that it's weeding out is somebody's ability to not only prospect, to also sell? Because that is interwoven yes. in that job, right? You have, there's no, there is no like, there's no canvassing for a second, for a second door-to-door salesperson to come by. You're exactly right, which is funny because that actually is, that was one of our sales pitches is exactly that, but it was, but it wasn't really kind of reality. And this is, you, you'll, anyone who's had this happen, they can, it'll resonate with them where an alarm salesperson is going door to door and they go to your house. They don't say I'm the salesperson offering this almost ever. The pitch is the same with almost every company I worked with. I worked with like three alarm door to door companies. It's I'm from the marketing side. We're, we're going to have the sales team out in a couple of weeks. What we're looking for is example homes, almost like a model home, great looking house, one that where they really keep up with their yard. It's got great curb appeal. And we're looking to use them as a marketing home. If you allow us to put your sign in your front yard so we can market the fact that there's some social proof here. There's people already using this. We'll give you this, this, and this for free. And then you turn over your, your binder and it's got the free keypad and it's got the upgraded stuff and everything like that. And people see that and they'll do one or two things. They'll be like, hmm. And it's like, okay, we might have a deal here. Or they'll be like, yeah, completely not interested. And candidly, I never tried to overcome those. But it is kind of funny. Like that is... But then, they, then you you do close after that. Like you're going to get inside and you're going to close the deal. And the reality of it is, is there a sales team that's coming? Well, probably there's always a sales team coming, but it's not laid out <laughs> the way that it's indicated. Right. You know, right. which it, I mean, it is what it is. Door to door is a different world than tech sales. Sorry to get to you. I could lie to you, but uh, that's what it is. Um, or that's what it always was. Um, and uh, yeah, man, I, I think that you are right there where you, if you've done these full cycle sales, um, where there's no such thing as an SDR. They'd laugh about it if you brought up the idea of one, car sales included. It, it's a double-edged sword, though, because you do learn to close, um, and you do learn to navigate a uh, buyer's journey and the, the sales process in a way that a lot of SDRs aren't going to pick up on just from their standard training that they get because you've just seen the other side of the ball a bit. You know, you've gone further down uh, all the way from point A to Z, not point A to point D. But where that can hurt is that they can often oversell um, when it comes to booking the meeting. When they learn about part of the product, their natural inclination, a lot of the time I've found, is to start selling hard on those things that they learn about that they like. And the reality is, man, it's less is more. And SDR should be doing more of a discovery. They should be diagnosing problems. They should be diagnosing how it's affecting the business and then booking a meeting. The way I relate it, man, is... Uh, it's kind of wild. I don't know if I've ever told you this one. It's like the dunk contest back in the day. 
versus nowadays. Dunk contests back in the day when I came up, you know, I, I, I was born in 84, so I was watching those on VHS, a lot of the old Jordan ones all the way up to Vince Carter. And, dude, they dunked, they made it the first time. And the level of excitement, because they flushed it the first time instead of having to do a redo where they tried something and they missed the dunk, was so much different back then. Like, the, you, you'd be so pumped. And then, like, it, it progressed to this thing where, like, They'd make an attempt in like 2010 and above. They'd miss it like three times. And then they'd finally make it. It's like, dude, I am not as pumped. I already knew what you were trying to do. That level of like anticipation and excitement for something new to happen was not there. And it, it, it's the same concept where you're revealing all of this shit before they get to the AE. And then the AE shows it to him. And it's like, dude, I already knew about that. You're not as excited. And by the way, not to sound bad to SDRs, but what are the chances that the SDR sells that as well as the AE does? The AE does it every day. They've been trained on it. They already have probably tested stuff. What works, what doesn't. Leave something to the imagination. You know, you're showing up to the call naked. Like, we're on the first date. Like, leave a little bit to the imagination, man. And it will absolutely help take the prospect to a higher peak impulse when they're on the call with the AE. So that is one thing I've noticed with people that do full cycle is like just natural inclination. It's like, I just want to get into it. I just want to sell. And it's like, then it's not your job. Your job almost isn't to sell at all. It's just to find a problem and hint at a solution and generate a little bit of curiosity and interest. Yeah. I always think about it as like you did. I think that's a way better analogy. I've always thought about it as like the waiter and the chef. Like how the chef talks to you and how the waiter talks to you are entirely different. Like if you've ever like talked that. to the chef, um, how they think about the food, what they think is important, um, you, you know, zero. I mean, I'm not culinary. So if I talk to the chef, I'm not typically getting it. It's not gotten me excited like maybe a waiter would. Yep. Different role. But you're. I like the Duncan analogy. I think that's perfect. It's like, hey, bro, yeah. we already knew what you were doing and now we're not excited. Yeah, it just doesn't hit the same way. You know, just think of anything where like you've already, dude, I mean, you, you, you see a meme before and then your wife shows it to you later. Are you as excited? No. Do you laugh that second time? No, no. you already saw no. it, you know, like it, it could be anything. It's like the first time you see something that's impactful, that is, that, that's the best opportunity you're going to have to generate excitement. So it's essentially, and I'm trying to get away from this analogy too, SD, you don't want an SDR to shoot the bullets out of the gun of the account executive and then they're left with nothing, you know, like you want to save bullets. Like, I, I don't know really what other analogy to put it into. I know gun analogies probably aren't, aren't quite hitting the same way they did 14 years ago. But if you shoot every bullet that's in your revolver before they even get into the demo, you're not leaving that AE with much to be deadly with. No. And I think it's super, you know, my observation, um, is that it's really important to get people through the steps of the process in order for them. Like, I believe that there's a lot of pressure to consolidate the stages. And I think that really negatively impacts the sales cycle. And people can disagree with me, but when I look at clients or I look at people that we're interacting with and they're not closing at a high rate, a lot of times it's because they're collapsing all these stages into one stage. And they're not building up the anticipation that needs to be created yep. to get somebody excited. Yep. Um, I a hundred percent agree. It's one of my, one of the things that I like, I definitely believe in most is, um, is stages and steps to the sale. And I think the, the, to me, the biggest differentiator between someone that's great long-term at other, at any job is whether or not they can identify all the steps to their sale. They know the entry gates. They know the exit gates. They know what tells them that they're on a step versus whether or not they haven't made it there yet. They know their goal of what they need to accomplish on that step. And then they start asking questions. All right, is there a step that's missing? Am I looking at a flight of stairs where there's two steps missing where I'm going to fall through if I don't add some steps here? And also, are there too many steps? Like, is there one in here that has no bearing on whether or not I'm going to have success? Because every step has a conversion rate. And it's never 100%. So if you have a step that's not necessary, that can be just as bad as taking a step out. Yep. Because oh, now you've added a conversion rate that isn't necessary to be there. Um, you know, as you're talking here, I, you know, I think the sales cycle is like a good movie. You know, like you got to have a climax. You want to build up to a climax. You yeah, got right. a hero and then you got a completion. And, yep. and what happens is if there's 
if there's dumb stuff in the movie, if there's too much, too many steps, you bail. If there's yeah. not enough, you don't get excited. It's just like watching a TV show or a movie. If if the beginning of the movie is really slow and the rest of the movie's awesome, the production crew hadn't done their job because they they need to get you through all the emotional stages for you to buy. Um, you know, I like that. I, I like that a lot. It relates to uh, someone hit me up yesterday and they said, hey, um, they're moving our demo to, from 30 minutes to 45. And they're like, that's where they want us to hit. And they're like, I like doing a 30 minute demo. And candidly, I also like doing a 30 minute demo. I think it keeps why the, why they want to move to 45. So I didn't watching? break the, into okay. that and get the 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 why because I had a feeling that if I asked them the why, that they were going to complain more and think about the reasons why it's going to be a negative. And the reality is it's an uncontrollable. The company told you 45. Uh, it, so you can either buck the system, uh, hurt your brand look like a complainer, or you can focus on the things that you can control. So a good example would be, um, dude, I don't know how long the movie Dude, Where's My Car is, but I bet you if it was a <laughs> minute longer, I wouldn't be happy about it. That being said, I know Scarface and The Godfather came with two VHSs back in the day. <laughs> they were so long, but I didn't give a shit. I'm watching yeah. both of them because I wanted more. I wanted more at the end. I, I like the, 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 So yeah, your demo is going to be a little bit longer. But there's movies that are longer than other movies too. It's very, it's very good, yes. like kind of way to relate it. it. You control the content to some degree. You control your tone for sure. You control the level of engagement that you have with your prospect as you go through the demo. So yeah, if your movie's going from 30 minutes to 40, 45 minutes, then it better be a good movie. You better ask yourself, how can I make this a better movie? Because to me, I think a lot of people don't play this up enough. They're, they're, they talk more about like asking the prospect questions so the prospect will visualize whether or not they um, you know, could see this as a solution to their problem. What I'm worried about more than any of that is am I keeping them engaged? Yes. Have they checked out? Because I know me, when I take a demo, dude, I am the fastest to check out. If I get any kind of message or anything like that, I'm quickly not paying attention anymore. So like my worry, just based on my own personality, is like I have to keep them engaged. If they're not engaged, they're not listening. If they're not listening, I'm not really selling. I'm just kind of background music. Well, I, so you nailed the question. So I think the questions, you know, um, so lots of conversation, you know, on LinkedIn about discovery, the importance of discovery. I think that yep. that's all important. But what you're really looking for, and I could not agree en en enough or more, uh, you need engagement. Unengaged buyers don't buy, period. Yep. Unengaged people don't date. Like if you're not engaged in a, if you're in a relationship and you're not into it, you're not going to date the person. If you're in a yep. sales cycle and you're not into it, you're not going to buy. People who are yeah. into stuff don't buy stuff. Yeah. I think that's great, man. I think those, those are great. Well, it's kind of funny that great. um, a lot of theory on LinkedIn. A lot of, a lot, lot of theory. theory, a lot of new ideas. Yeah. You need some? No, I'm just like, oh, hey, man, yes, there's a lot of theory. Yeah, there. dude, yeah. Lot, there's a lot of theory on LinkedIn. There's a, a lot of a, a lot of extra ideas and everything like that. And it's very funny how it's it, it can get a little bit out there on it. And it's all about like, well, this is the buyer's journey. We're customer centric. We're not worried about the salesperson. But it, it is wild that where the rubber meets the road, you ask someone like yourself, a CEO of a company, the end all be all decision maker. And it's, it's shocking how often the older stuff and the older philosophy resonates with the people that actually stroke the check. So it's one thing to talk about theory. And it's one thing to verify with maybe a VP of sales. And they're like, oh yeah, that's what's going on nowadays. When you talk about the people that actually like, no, nah, dude, it's my business. You'd be shocked at what they actually care about. Uh, and it, like, so to me, the thing that I always hate to hear is like, uh, the, this whole ask a million questions. And I know that there can be merit to it, but when someone gets on the phone with me, I feel like asking questions before you've, you've given me any value is more invasive and more rude than just pitching me. Because to me, it's like, you're wasting my goddamn time. And I don't even know whether or not I should give you my time yet. You're asking me questions. You haven't earned the right to oh, learn anything. About my business. Did I tell you about the Gartner sales guy? Did we talk about the Gardner? I don't know. Sales I don't run? think so. Okay. So Gardner, if somebody in Gardner's listening to this, I hope you guys are listening. I hope you guys are listening up. I'm I might send this transcript to you. So <clears throat> here's what happens. I get an email. Okay. Um, so labor right before Labor Day. So I get like a ton of emails and a ton of 
uh, phone calls from a gar- from a Gardner rep, and the Gardner rep is like blowing my my email up to the point that I think the email's broke. So when he calls me and I see his name on my phone, I took it because I believe that his, I, I thought maybe I, I just had been harassed. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take yep. this call. So he says, Hey, will you, t-, you know, Hey, Jonathan, I'm like, Hey, I know you. I, I got a ton of emails from you. I thought your email tool was broke. I thought your sales law was broke. And uh, he's like, Oh yeah, yeah. He's like, Hey, can we take a meeting? Do you know about Gardner? I'm like, yep, let's do it. So here's what I'm going to, this is a, a, a long story, but here's essentially what happens. He spends the first five minutes telling me about how awesome Gardner is. He spends the next couple minutes telling me about how he's part of the the most explosive sector of Gardner. And then he asked me what I think about Gardner and what I know. And I basically said, hey, I know you guys are getting your butt kicked by G2 crowd, um, by all these, you know, you guys are getting circumvented. I probably knew too much and I probably was a jerk to him. But um, he then goes on. I'm like, "Okay, well, here's the deal. I know all about that. I know you guys haven't been in the small business sector you know, tell me, you know, why would I buy Gartner? And he's like, well, you buy Gartner for the analyst. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I don't feel like uh, I need the analyst. I mean, I talk to all my clients. He's like, well, you don't talk to the ones that don't buy from you. I'm like, yeah, dude, I talk to people that buy and don't buy from me all the time. I'm in the trenches. I don't know what you guys could bring to the table. So just tell me if I scratch you a $40,000 check, what am I getting? And he just kept repeating over and over what, like the same thing. So then I was, I kept asking him questions. And I'm trying to understand, like, hey, I give you money. What am I going to get? And so all of a sudden he goes, um, you know what? Every time I ask a question, you because he's grilling me. He's like, hey, what are you trying to do with your – I mean, he's just railing me with questions. And, um, I mean, just all over me. And I kept trying to get from him. I'm trying to understand the business model so I can figure out if it's something that we can use. And I, he just yep. cannot articulate to be a business proposition. Like, I just wanted to know, hey – Hey, Troy, if I send you $40,000, what, what is Gardner going to give me? And he's like, well, you're going to get the analyst. So he got so aggressive with his questions that I stopped him and I said, hey, man, have you read the challenger? Sa- like, are you a challenger salesperson? Puffs his chest out. He's like, yes, I am. And I was like, OK, well, here's the deal, man. You were doing this all wrong. I'm good friends with Jen Allen from the chief evangelist over there. We're going to call her. We're going to get her on the phone. And she's going to school you. And I hate school and salespeople, but I'm like, she's going to school you on how to be a challenger sales rep. And so what ends up happening in this conversation, at some point he goes, I asked the question. He's like, you're the prospect. I'm the salesperson. I asked the questions. This is not how this is supposed to work. And he hung up on me. (laughs) He totally lost his, he totally lost his, uh, lost his marbles. That's funny, man. I think, um, you know what I think it is a little bit? I think it's all of this training on the questions to ask and it's, what do you do with them? What do you do with the answers that you get? And it's, I think where a lot of AEs in particular, and I think SDRs too can, can fail, but particularly AEs is they will ask questions And then they'll go into the presentation and they'll tend to show the things that they like. They'll tend to use the talk tracks of the things that excite them. And that could have no bearing on the the level of excitement of the end person that they're talking to, the decision maker, the influencer for challenger sales, the influencer, you know, and um, it's, there's, I think the reason why there is so much of that is because you don't lose a sale by asking questions. You lose a sale by making statements, but you also don't earn a sale by asking questions. No, you You earn a sale by making statements too. So this fear, and I think it's a really easy cheat code for a lot of like influencers to be, to say, Hey, whenever they tell you this, ask them this. And it's like, all right, cool. Then what do I do? After that, now that I asked them a question, then, then what? And it's there, there doesn't seem to be that much there because Anytime you tell somebody a statement to make, you're putting yourself out there in a, in a way different way than when you're asking questions, because you're running the risk of losing the sale anytime you make a statement if it's the wrong one. But I think that's what's lacking, and that's what like, students need the most, or people that are trying to up their sales game need the most, is like, yeah, you got to ask questions, relevant questions. Now, you need the advice on how to turn that into a sales pitch, like, sorry, is that a perception or a reality long. like that you make a statement and that you lose the sale? Yeah. Cause like how often do you lose a sale if you're making, if you're asking questions, if they're relevant, it's pretty I mean, You rare. may not be gaining the sale though. 
I mean, he also may not be right. getting it. Yep. By asking right. a question, I mean, you got to move the – most people buy stuff excited, not unexcited. So I believe yeah. you got to get – now, that doesn't mean that I have to – that I have to be bumping with energy. But, like, yeah. most people buy stuff because there's some perceived excitement about how it's going to change or solve their problem. Yeah. Um, I believe that excited buyers buy stuff um, because – I just think about my own self. I think I think we all have some portion of Walter Mitty in our mind when it comes to the products we buy. Like mm-hmm. we are we are telling ourselves stories about how this solution or product is going to change our lives. And I know that to be true because when you get somebody really excited with two C level buyers, you know what they start doing? They start talking to each other, and you're just sitting there. And what are they saying to each other? Oh man, hey hey Troy you know, we could totally get rid of that one rep we have, or we could do this other thing. Or like, imagine if you just got to walk into the office and all your sales guys were just having conversations and that was it. Like you didn't have to like beat them anymore to do it. Yeah. Um, that is funny. Cause that is exactly, I, I have an experience with that as well. When I was an entry level, uh, AE, um, one of the things that we do is we get to the end, we'd go for pricing. This is a very transactional sale. You get the product concept, and I'd say, all right, go over standard pricing and say, I might have something else going on. Well, before I shoot myself in the foot, stick my foot in my mouth and tell you something that I can't do, give me just a couple seconds. Let me check with my manager real quick. Open the door and shut it. Hit mute. One out of every five, the, if there were two people on the call, they reveal the whole deal right there. Like, how many should we buy? We're ready to go. And that obviously dictates what happens next a bit. You know, but you're exactly right. That's exactly what ha- what what happens. Like when they're when they're excited, you you know it. They're going to start having that conversation, and often they're having that conversation kind of regardless, like while you're going through it. Um, but man, that was it was a helpful cheat code back in the day for sure. Yeah, no, I think that's really. I think that's so. You've uncovered like so many really interesting things about the sales cycle. I think while we're on this phone call, just with your previous experience, you know, one of the things that you talked about early on in the conversations, you talked about in the used car or not in the used car in the car space, you yep. talked about um, being able to get people excited. Do you not feel like there's that same opportunity in the software space to create that excitement and what's contributing to that? I think there are hundred percent is the opportunity. I think that if I had to guess and it is really guessing, I think that in the tech space in particular, there is this, like notion you you really want to come off even more than other spaces, like not a salesperson. You don't want to come off as salesy whatsoever, but then it's like, well, you have to sell still. I, you, that, like you, you should be selling. And when tech salespeople do, when they actually kind of sell the sizzle a little bit and try to get people excited, it works. It does get, people will get excited, you know? And I think it's, it ties into what you were saying about the discovery is like, the whole point of the discovery is is figuring out the things that are going to excite them enough like the to want to buy. Yeah, you know, you're not just diagnosing a milk toast, cut and dry, boring problem. You're supposed to turn the stuff that you collected in that discovery into excitement a bit. And, I mean, it might not be as exciting as selling them a car, but you know, there's there's something pretty exciting about the fact that I've got a problem in my business and you're showing me an easy way to solve it. I'd be, I'm pretty excited when I see that, you know, and I, I think that it's more like, well, I'll just show it to them and then I'll ask them. I don't want to be too over the top. And it's like, man, why don't you just try it? Why don't you try to get them a little bit more excited about it? Why don't you kind of like I- I exhibit your level of excitement on the things that you think they might be excited about based on your discovery? It's not going to hurt the deal. It's going to help it. Um, you're a big Ed Milet fan, right? I love Ed Milet. Okay, I love Ed Milet too, man. So he's got a he's got a. uh, I watched a video last week uh, where he was giving a keynote, and he said um, to a group of security buyers or security uh, teams, I think like door knocking security teams. um, He said, "Hey, look, I think there's a misperception that a lot of people have is that your prospect has to believe in what they're buying." He said, "They don't have to believe in what you're buying. We buy stuff all the time where we don't believe in the product. They have to believe in." that you believe that that it does what it's supposed to do. And I think that's missing. When you think about the technology sale, the focus is on the product and not on the belief of the person. And ultimately, I believe the best definition of sales that I've heard is from Kyle Porter from Sales Loft, 
which is, it may have came from Tony Robbins, but is sales is me transferring my passion to you. That's what, that's what sales is that yep. I'm transferring what I, my passion to on, onto you. And then you're yep. becoming passionate about it as well. Yeah. And I don't I, think there's any yep. shame in that. I mean, if you're what, what's, what's, the, what's in, sh what's shame in being excited about something, you Who know, who wants to work for a company you're not excited about. Like 100%. I, I told people to buy a product from somebody yeah. where the sales guy's not excited. Yeah. It, it's yeah. I, I don't know who started that quote. Sales, a transference of certainty, uh, sales, the transference of emotion, I think yep. is, the, uh, certainty is the way that, uh, Jordan Belfort says it. Um, it's a transference of emotion is another one. Dude, what I say is, is a transference of everything. If you have a bad call on the last call that you're transferring that as well, if you don't check your attitude, if something went wrong at home before you got in and started to prospect, that's getting transferred. If you don't check yourself, if you're wildly excited about something that happened, that could transfer and it could transfer the wrong way. If you don't kind of calm yourself down a little bit and you're not in that pocket where it, it works. You can be overly excited as well. Like you have to think about where you're at internally, because when you get on the phone with somebody, you're transferring whatever that is. But I don't think passion, I don't necessarily think, I mean, I do think it's good to have energy, but yeah. I also don't think that that's, I don't, I don't necessarily like, I think there's great salespeople that are excited yep. and that are good sellers that aren't energetic, that aren't necessarily like, you know, I agree. Yep. Let me high five you. You know, they're not like, yep. um, what's that commercial where the football player, the Geico commercial where the football player knocks down the, the ham sandwich. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's I, like, I yeah. Um, yep. So I don't, I, I've seen really good salespeople that are stoic, I've seen, but they believe, they believe in the product yep. and they're, they're excited, not necessarily like, Hey, I'm going to high five you excited, but they have a belief yep. and passion for the solution. Yeah. And I think I, I get this question a lot, which is like, which one's better? Which one's better? The stoic uh, person that internalizes and that may be more introvert or is it the extrovert that's out there? And the real answer is wh whoever can do both the best is probably the best one. Yes. Sales is very much like acting and the best actors have the best range. And, and why is that important? Well, resonate with more people. Uh, a big part of sales is mirroring the customer. All right. You call in to Dade City, Florida, where I'm at, you can build rapport for a half hour and get what it's going to work. If they like you more and they relate to you, they'll buy from you. It's the type of people that want to go to dinner first before they buy, right? You take that same energy and call somebody that's in Midtown Manhattan, you're screwed. They're not buying from you. So unless you want to be able to sell only a, a small subset of people, you have to work a little bit to develop your range. The better you mirror a more diverse group of customers or prospects, the better, the more people that you can sell, the more people that you can sell safely assure you, you're probably going to sell more in general. So, so good. So good example here. This is, so there's a, um, you nailed it, man. You got to be able to read the room and I'm going to say, read the room when it comes to the questions read the room when it comes to the sales cycle, you got to be able to read the room and read the buyer and you got to be able to adjust. Um, when I use that Gartner story, that's really what he did. He didn't, he didn't adjust. He did not make a change. I was a great buyer. He did not change to me. I was engaged, which I think is my takeaway here is that engaged buyers buy. So when yeah. we talk about all these, you know, asking questions and all that, if you're asking questions and not getting a better engagement footing, then the questions aren't worth aren't, aren't worth anything. Um, so, yeah, man, I um I have an I have an outside of sales example of this that I think well it might resonate. I but it is it's very it's very valid, right? So um, when I started to to battle rap live, I, I, it was in a, a, a league called Grind Time, um, which I actually ended up buying. Which I love. Rap. You were in a battle battle rap league, man. Okay, yeah. keep going. I think so I when I started, um, I started in the upstate New York division. Um, in Syracuse. And it was very blue collar. And the style of rap that they liked was a lot of gunplay, a lot of loud, boisterous, you know, aggressive, um, more serious style, um, similar to like, you know, what a lot of the, the big stuff in like URL and everything is now probably one person this resonates with so far. But then so I that's how I practice. I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'm not going to inject a lot of comedy here. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna go ham right off the bat. And it worked. It worked well for my and I, I injected a little bit of comedy, but then I moved on to Canada, King of the Dot. I had a battle in Montreal. Um, man, I was like, I I did I, I did my research, watched every season of Trailer Park Boys before I got to Canada, watched all the battles. I was like, they're way more into the jokey comedy more like the old school freestyle battle rap used to be where you're more making people laugh than react crazy to a bar that you said. So I started to inject that a little bit my first time. And the second time when I made it to Toronto on the main stage, I, I doubled down and I, I did a lot more self-deprecating shit that I never would do in, in upstate New York and Syracuse that, that, that self-deprecating stuff wouldn't play the same way, but it was my best performance. Because I knew that taking what would work somewhere else and bringing that there wasn't going to work the same way. I had to grow and I had to adapt and I had to consider my audience. And doing that was a giant game changer for me. I, like I probably wouldn't have done well at all in King of the Dot, which is, you know, arguably my, my favorite league. I'm still in their fantasy football. Um, you know, like it, it, so it, it is big where it's like you have to really consider your audience. And how do you do that? Well, the way that I did it was I did research. You know, I researched the company. I researched the crowd. I knew I was performing at Club Excess, which I don't think exists anymore. So I looked at every battle that was at Club Excess. I looked at all of the marquee ones from the people that I admired. Funny enough, one of them, Jesus Christ, Pat Stay, um, just died. He got stabbed to death over the weekend, um, a few days after his son's fifth birthday. And dude was an absolute icon, hilarious, great dude, you know, um, but it, it, it was something where I did a lot of that research. And um, it, if I didn't do that research and I just went in there assuming that it was going to be like every other call uh, or, or every other battle, I probably would have got eight alive, you know, um, because I did you well in the first round and then the other your opponents on their heels. Like they're like, oh, man, like it kind of it kind of takes away. So if I didn't do that, it probably would have killed me, you know, and I ended up crushing it. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to tail back to something you said early on about sales prospecting, doing too much selling. Is there a risk? You're talking about something that probably very distinctly applies to the AE. Can the SDR yep. over research and out and play themselves out of a good opportunity? <laughs> yeah. I can tell you one way. If you're doing any research on an inbound lead before you call it, you're doing too much research. There's not a shred of research that will give you more value on an inbound lead than calling them faster. And yeah, I, that 100%. is the hill I'll die on twice. Anyone that wants to argue with me, show me the statistics. There is no way, dude, some of the ex reasoning behind why they don't call right away is the most ham handed. You don't belong in sales reasoning of all time. Like, well, they'll like, it's disrespectful if I didn't already do research before I reach out to them. Dude, they submitted a lead. The best thing you can do is get Good in contact call. with them and learn about them on the phone. Like you don't, you don't need to earn the right to call them. They raise their hand. And I, I've seen some where like the, the standard callback time for an inbound lead is like 72 hours. It's like they might have already bought by then. You know, they may have ran into a real salesperson that actually called them right away. Oh, a hundred percent inbound lead speed, getting them on the phone. I mean, we, we, we call everybody within a couple minutes of when they hit the form. And I can't tell you how many times people are like, man, that is fast. We've been trying for three days to get a hold of, you know, fill in the blank. Um, the I, I, don't, first impression. I tried to Google this and I couldn't find it. I had been told one time that speed is the number one indicator of quality in a restaurant. That when, with the speed in which you get your, product is the primary thing in which you define quality. I don't know if that's true, but it does make, it does make sense. I mean, if it's slow, I definitely have lots more time to think about how bad it's going to potentially be. I mean, it's the, uh, if it's not the number one indicator of quality at the very least, it's the number one first impression because before you taste that food, you saw it come out fast. So that's already a good first impression right off the bat is that man, they're efficient. Man, their their wait staff is efficient with getting it in, and whoever's back there cooking is efficient as well, and they're making it happen. Like you're already in a good mood before you start to eat. You know, like there, there's there's something to that. I mean, look, McDonald's was built on their efficiency. 
That's all it was. Was that I mean, figured I, out? You obviously have to have qual- you know you have to have fast and fast and bad tasting. Uh, you know, right, awesome, that's, but, that, that's the right. part is McDonald's it tasted all right, but they were man, they were fast. They, they were, were fast. Efficient. I mean, I, so my little Google here is like, hey, why is speed important in the restaurant? It says faster service without compromising quality in your restaurant typically means higher customer satisfaction and increased revenue. So speed, I do think speed is greatly attached to the mental concept of quality. For yeah. sure. Um, yeah. And I think another thing to keep in mind there, just to keep with like the restaurant analogy, right, is that you, as an SDR, when you're calling an inbound lead, if you're trying to relate it to like the restaurant, they're not at your restaurant yet. They submitted an inquiry to potentially eat there. They're not waiting at your table. They're looking at a bunch of different restaurants. Okay. Yep. So you want to get the food out quick and know that you're going to get it out quick and you sit them down at your table. When you call, you effectively brought them into the restaurant and sat them down. Now they are at the table. But until you make that call, they're not there. And there's a high chance they're at a whole different restaurant. And guess what? They decided that the food might not be great, but it's good enough to buy. And now when you reach out, you're done. They already bought. I couldn't tell you how many times when I was working like as an AE where I would get inbounds, where like I, they'd be done. I, it was a one call close because I just assumed that it could be. You already submitted an inbound. You probably want to buy. Let's go. Like I, and and then it's like if there's other salespeople that are sure are like me, man. If you're if you're not quick on the draw when it comes to an inbound lead, you're going to lose to a better salesperson. Because guess what? The better salesperson is the one that gets the deals in the most often, the fastest. So we've covered, agreed, and we've covered so much great stuff, but there's something you just said. I just assumed it could be a one-call close. I think that's so important, man. Too many people assume it has to be a two two calls. Assume it has to be it's three my, calls. Um, assume it has to be a demo. For advice. Yeah, whenever I, people ask me for advice on the enterprise side, which candidly, that's where the least of my experience is, is on the enterprise side. But I have some. And what I tell them is one thing that can help you is don't assume that it's going to take you six months to close a deal. Assume that you might be able to get the deal in incredibly fast and then just gauge the prospect on whether or not it's going to take that long. Because I think with, with enterprise, everyone assumes that it's going to take forever. It's going to take a long time. This is our process. And because of that, that 10% or even 5% that could have come in faster, they don't get they don't, or they, they don't get it right away when they could have gotten it very close to right away. And what happens is, well, what if competition acted as if? What if they tried to get it in faster? What if they maybe added a little bit of tension to the deal? Maybe they brought in a time-based incentive because they thought that it would resonate with them and it worked. And now you don't have that deal. So to me, it's like, never assume that your process is going to take longer. Assume that it might be able to happen faster um, plan for perfection with a contingency plan. That's how I train I them. Man. So when we go through like your sales pitch framework, like I'm doing with um, students right now in my course, it's all, it's like, wait, where's the overcoming objection part? Where's the part where you have to do a discovery to get it in? No, we're, we're going to do that later. You're learning your framework based on the 10% that are going to buy. And you're going to learn that perfectly. And I'll teach you all of the contingency plans after, but this is the foundation we're building the house on, you know? And I think that the assumption that things are going to go wrong is one of my, like the things that I hate the most with like modern sales is like, you're assuming that things aren't going to go your way. And all sales from the beginning of time is based on the exact opposite. Assume the sale. You know, that's, that's like the, the, the largest tenant that there is, but you're assuming, you're assuming not the sale. You're, you're, you're assuming failure. You're assuming that it's going to take you longer. Where does all this bad uh, mojo come from? This bad sales, uh, you know, like, for example, we have historical, uh, you know, we have a historical track history of sales over a hundred years, right? Yep. From, I would sort of, and then I would sort of consider like NCR as the first big national cash register machines is the first big conglomerate sales team. Um, but we have a hundred years of history. And at some point we start leaving the the foundational principles. Where, wh- why are we here? How did that happen? Well, I think the mark of a great salesperson, I think above anything else is, is, is it's completely the, your level of skill, whether you're wildly elite or at the bottom is, is very much tied to how well you can put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're selling. And the more that you get away from that, the worse, the worse that things get. And I think that a lot of like the, 
the strategy that comes out nowadays and the theory that comes out nowadays is not based on people putting themselves in the shoes of the buyer. It's based on themselves putting themselves in their own shoes. What would I do if I was them? But it's like, no, what would what what would they do? You have to you have to understand them more than trying to just come from a space of yourself. And a lot of times you I notice with it, it's there's a lot of doubt that's injected in there that doesn't even exist or it doesn't always exist. So when you, when you add in there that it's like, well, you haven't earned the right to do this yet. You should do this first. This comes off as disrespectful. All right. Have you actually asked, have you tried, have you tried the other method? And when you tried it, did you try it already assuming that it wasn't going to work? So you actually never really did it. Because like we said, sales and transference of certainties. People will be like, oh, yeah, I tried the old, old ways. It doesn't work. No, you didn't want them to work. You confirmation biased your own experiment. You know, like, like, so I think that it's a lot of that as well. I think there's a, you said something. I think there's a really big misperception that, um, and I'm a, I'm a big, I buy a lot of stuff annoyed. I'm excited, but I'm annoyed. You annoyed me. Like, yeah. you annoyed me. I didn't love you. I loved you, but you annoyed me. And I don't think having negative feelings as the buyer, I know I'm contradicting myself a little bit from what I said earlier. Um, yep. We're complex and I think multiple emotions can exist in, uh, in one direction, mm -hmm. in one, in a, in, in a decision. It's not like I can be, ha I can be happy and annoyed at the same time. I can be excited about what the future holds, but still annoyed with you. Um, yep. I think we're highly, I think we try to stay away from negative emotions in the buying cycle. And I actually think that's, Okay. I mean, I buy a lot of stuff where the guy irritated me before, you know, like I was just generally annoyed. I was annoyed. I was irritated. You know, yeah, he did totally. something that kind of like, you know, caught me off guard. Yep. Um, so I don't think those are bad. I don't think that's bad. I don't think the, I don't think it's bad to have some negative emotions in the buying cycle. I don't. I mean, what do they say when it comes to like a, a negotiation or a compromise? Like both sides are, are, aren't are happy uh, at, at kind of the same level. And that's how you know it was a good one. Like, you know, like that's, it, it, there's kind of something to that. And I think that that's gone away the more that people are trying to gear away from adding any level of tension. Um, and by tension, I mean, let's be honest, a little bit of pressure. Like that's, people are like, oh, high pressure sales environment. But dude, like, and I understand that I get it. Right. But at the same time, I've known forever that I should have solar on my house, but I just need somebody to literally push, push me into doing it. I need to be pushed. I know that I need to be pushed. I need someone to come in here and kind of waste my time and push me. And it just hasn't happened yet. But is it that the job as the sales guy? Like if, if you, if I could tell salespeople anything, it's like, read the room, read your buyer, figure out this person needs a hug or they need, do they need slapped on the butt or tapped on the back? You know, yep. there's about six inches from this to this, you know, hitting somebody, you know, do they need to be hugged or do they need to be spanked? And, you know, I think that's the job of the salesperson is you have to read your buyer. If I push this guy, what's going to happen? Yep. And, and sometimes you uh, might push and you might push them off the ledge and you got to start over. You got to go to somebody else because you made a mistake, yep. you made a calculated risk and you were wrong. And the, so the key to that is there's, there's ways of helping calculate that risk and discovery does not end when you start to present it should be, should be occurring throughout the sale, you know, and you should be asking questions that help gauge that. One of the things that I like to do, I get to the end and we're at pricing is I'll, I may have asked them like already a couple of times, like what the desired timeline would be. In other words, like if, if you saw this and it worked perfectly, how soon would you want something like this to be rolled out to your team if it worked the way that you wanted it to? And then once you show it to them, I ask again, because before I go over pricing, I want their window of when they're lo looking to buy within. Oh, yeah, we probably wouldn't buy anything like this until the end of the month, you know, or the end of the quarter. And it's like, all right, cool. That's my window. Now, my job is to try to shorten that window a little bit um, and, and figure out how I can do that. And one of the ways that I always do is I, I like to do some kind of a time-based incentive. doesn't have to be pricing related. But let's say that it is. You know, I say like, hey, um, I'll go over standard pricing. Uh, my goal there is to get them to, you know, really buy into the fact that there's value at that standard price. Like, look at it like, yeah, we might wait until our desired timeline, but this pricing makes sense. I, I buy into I would be getting a return. And then from there, I, I give them a qualifying question to get an idea of whether or not I can get them to buy sooner. Got another option for you, Brad. Um, this option, I'll be candid, I'm a little hesitant to go over um, because it, it's a great option, but it's time sensitive. It's not something that I'd have forever. Um, let me ask you something. If I could get pricing 
where it maybe makes a little bit more sense to you guys. Maybe it's a little bit more budget friendly than what you see uh, on the screen here. Do you think that this is something that you might be able to make an expedited decision on if it made enough sense to you? So what I do, what I'm doing there is I'm looking for permission to create tension. That's what I'm looking for. And the way that I do that and the way that I position that question is as soft as possible. And I think a lot of times when people do that, they're looking for the hard yes there and you don't need one. You need permission to create tension. So they say, I've got another option for you. It's time sensitive. Would you be able to make okay. an expedited you, decision today? You could come to us. I mean, that's perfect because I might say yes. If you can, that would, or I might say, Hey, you know what? You could bring this thing to me and it'd be, and for, you give it to me for free today. And I still wouldn't buy it because I don't have the resources to execute it. Yep. And then, and then, you know, you know, and you can go from there. And even if I get a soft, yes, what that allows me to do is I, I worked in there, I baked in, I'm a little hesitant to go over this because it's time sensitive and it might not work with your timeline. So now when I'm applying any level of pressure, any level of tension is to go over that, whatever the promotion is, whatever the deadline would be. And I, I gauge the deadline based on that window that they just gave me and where I think I could get it to, just based on the conversation we've had. It is a bit of a judgment call. And then from there, if they're like, man, it feels like you're selling me a timeshare or it feels like you're selling me a used car, I can pull the ripcord. Man, that's exactly why I said I was a little hesitant to go over this. 100%. That is not the tone that I wanted to have come off, but I did want to present you with the best deal that I had. No problem. Feel free to use standard pricing. When should I follow up? And obviously you need to get next steps and take it from there. Yeah. No, uh, I, perfect. Perfect. I mean, that's such a great way to say it. It's such a great way to do it. You laid it on the table. You created an out for yourself. Look, you want people to buy on their timeline when it's comfortable, but you also want to create opportunities for them to do stuff sooner than later, I think as a salesperson, you know, time yep. crushes all deals. So yep. um, I think that's great. I think that's, um, I think that's perfect. I'm actually going to cut that and make that a clip of you. Cause I think that's a per, I think that's such a wonderful insight around creating tension and pressure. Yeah. So after this, uh, after this first course that we're doing, uh, the AE course will be shortly behind. Um, and um, the goal with that, I think we've talked about this before, is that there's a lot of salespeople that aren't in tech sales, but are making too much to start as an SDR. Yep. Like I, you know, back in the day, I went from director to SDR to get in. Um, and so, stu so stupid. Uh, the profit, it's all, anyways, keep, it's just keep so going. tough. Like I get it with a lot of companies. Process. Um, because for example, if I, when I was a director, you know, let's say like Panadoc, for example, I've got 10 SDRs. Those SDRs are busting their ass for me every day. They're learning and they're ready to move up. It's so hard for me to hire someone that doesn't have tech sales experience over them. Like the risk isn't worth the reward almost because although they don't have closed deal experience, I know they're a culture fit. I know that they've got the work ethic. I know they have the attitude. I know they know the product. There's so much that I know about them that I would rather I would rather risk promoting them and 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 keep my narrative of you move in as an SDR, you do the right things, you can move up if you do all of the right things. You know, as opposed to the alternative, it makes it tough. But I think that if you had someone who came from the outside and they had legitimate training, and I think more important than anything, and I did the same thing with my SDRs, they've got a recording. It's not, it's not maybe they can do the job. It's no, I can, I have a recording for you of them, a discovery call, a presentation on a tech, on a, on a tech offering, a demo and on pricing and negotiation, I can show you everything that I do in that process. I think then as a director, I would be like, all right, this is different. They may not have the experience, but Lord knows they put the work in to learn while working another job. What are we talking about here? It's a pretty safe bet to, 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 to entertain. Um, so I, I think that that's a missing piece right now uh, in terms of getting talent into tech sales is that you're only getting new talent that's entry level it's very rare that you're getting in these monsters that are not going to, it's not even swallowing their pride. They're not going to swallow their bank account by becoming an SDR, sure. but we, we want them. You want them in tech sales. There's so many that are so good. You just need to have that link that makes it so it's not as much of a risk for the, the person that's hiring them. Um, I love it. Well, I think part of the reason why the SDR model exists is because a risk to the company. It feels like you nailed it. It feels like less of a risk. Now, whether it is or not, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I think you can de-risk. You can de-risk with time. You give that person more time to get acquainted with your business while they're still working somewhere else. And I think the other thing you can do is um, uh, profile them. You can look at, you know, I, 
you can look at somebody. There's actually a really good, there's a company out there called Titan House that's, I think I talked to you maybe about on the staffing side where, where they have created a staffing platform that allows you to figure out what somebody's time frame for moving is. So yep. they're like, hey, this person's interested, but they're not going to move for three months or six months. That way you can move a bench or they can create a bench. Um, so I think that's great. I mean, because it's when you talk about somebody moving from, let's say they're selling med device and they want to come into sales. Typically what happens is, you know, I'm looking to fill a position. They're looking to leave and they're usually looking to leave right away. Right. And yep. so you're now in a, in a in a risky dice roll of is this person going to work out versus what I like what you're doing. I like the Titan House guys is that you're creating like a runway for these guys to make a trans potentially make a transition. And I think that's super important so that you're not just pulling the rip cord off and jumping off the cliff. Um, I think that helps the company de-risk as well. Agreed, man. I think there's, um, I think there's something there because there's definitely talent that's out there that could be absolute game changers for a, a tech sales organization that right now um, they, they would never even get interviewed. Oh, 100%. So let's do this. Let's let's do a second. Um, We're getting kind of tied on time here. So I want you to tell everybody where uh, where they can find you at. And then I want to have you on one more time so we can we can keep talking. Um, I've got about like 16. I got like 16 bullet points that came out of this conversation was so great. I mean, from the how to create urgency, how to talk about pricing, um, the experience you had as door to door salesperson, the dunk contest. Uh, My post tonight is going to be. Uh, what the what the old school dunk contest can teach you about being a good SDR. So yeah, many good I takeaways, to, man. I might need to edit some video and do that one. I haven't done it yet. I've been talking about. Oh, it you need years, to do a so. TikTok. Tell tell everybody how yeah. you get a hold of you. Where where can I where can I find you if I'm if I bumped into this episode? I don't yep. know. Troy Barter. Uh, LinkedIn. I accept all connection requests. So just Troy Barter on LinkedIn. TikTok. It's Troy Barter Sales. Posting a little bit less content lately because I'm I'm continuously adding modules every week for our salesorg.io full tech sales course. We have over 300 people that are enrolled. If you use promo code decision point, I'll take 60% off of the course. Um, I'll have the promo code live within the next probably 10 minutes or so. Um, and the uh, the goal of the course is if you're someone that's looking to break in to tech sales, maybe you have a little bit of sales experience, maybe you don't have any sales experience, maybe you're fresh out of high school or still in high school and you want to learn and you want to move into this, that I give you all of the practical information that you need. And more important, I give you the ability to execute on it. So as opposed to a lot of other courses that are very heavy on theory and you can pass tests and now you're ready. With me, the test is, is your how's your recorded role play? We're going to role play your pitch that I taught you there's unlimited times that you can try it. And when you are gra- when you graduate from my course, you're ready to get on the phone and dial. You're ready to go. No matter what company you work with, you're, you're good to go in a way that's different with any other course that's out there. And it's, it's probably inexpensive. Full price is $500. We're partnered with a, uh, a tech company that is a billion-dollar tech company. They're looking to hire 60 SDRs. So we're already handing over candidates once they pass their role play, even before they graduate. So if you're looking to get into tech sales and not just get in, but looking to be a top performer quickly and efficiently, by all means, salesorg.io. Um, uh, if you go to, uh, yeah, that's your best bet is salesorg.io. Get in there, promo code decision point, you can get 60% off. All right, man. Troy, as always, man, I loved it. Um, you know, I feel like I got a, you, you heard me.